Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me clearly? All right, perfect. Well, welcome to our breakout session, Secondary Capital, Removing Roadblocks and Building Bridges Towards Financial Inclusion. My name is Paul Woodruff, and I'm going to be serving as your moderator this morning. Um, before we get started, I wanted to go through a couple of housekeeping uh, rules uh, just to keep things orderly, and then we're going to hand things over to our very capable uh, presenters, Kathy Kim and I. Um, please know that the session is being recorded. You'll be able to access it through the conference website as well as on Inclusive's website within two weeks. Uh, to maintain the integrity of the recordings, we ask that you please remain on mute um, and uh, direct questions through the chat function. Uh, we are going to be taking those questions throughout the entire function. You can uh, submit questions uh, through the chat function and we will be sourcing those at the end. And if you experience any technical difficulties uh, during the uh, presentation, please feel free to send private uh, chat to our tech team. They will be very happy to help you. Um, so COVID-19's impact on the global community has created a ripple effect uh, that further exacerbates the wealth gap and equal access to financial services for most economically disadvantaged uh, segments of our society, that being the unbanked and under The session is going to explore strategies for leveraging secondary capital to both address systemic roadblocks for building more financially inclusive communities and also strengthen your credit union's financial performance. Um, speaking uh, on this topic today, uh, as I mentioned previously, we have uh, fantastic uh, presenters, Ahmed Campbell and Kathy Kim. Um, Ahmed Campbell uh, is Inclusive's Director of Lending and Development with more than 30 years in the credit union industry. Ahmed has served as a business development consultant supporting inclusive capital and mortgage teams. He's responsible for driving the growth of CDFI community development lending business lines and supporting the capacity of members to build and grow their operations through secondary capital and mortgage secondary marketing. Prior to joining Inclusive, he served as Chief Credit Officer at the Municipal Credit Union. Speaking after Ahmed is going to be Kathy Kim. Kathy Kim is the Director of Inclusive Capital. Kathy's work at Inclusive is focused on connecting CDCs to capital to strengthen their double bottom line of financial growth and community impact. Her role includes lending, underwriting, market analysis, and strategy development, advising on credit union regulations, business planning and impact design to help credit unions strengthen their double bottom line of financial growth and community impact. Prior to her work at Inclusive, Kathy worked on housing and immigrant rights campaigns and complex civil litigation. Um, before I hand things over to Ahmed, we do have a couple of poll questions though, and so I'm going to be relying on our very handy and capable uh, tech staff to help me through this. So um, You'll see a uh, first poll question coming up before we get kicked off to help kind of guide this. The question is, is your credit union eligible for secondary capital? And it's okay if you're unsure. We have yes, no, and unsure. So if you could please submit your response, that will help us as we move forward. We're going to take a couple more seconds for uh, folks that are on this uh, in this breakout session to answer that move before we move to the second question. Again, the question is, is your credit union edge eligible for secondary capital? Yes, no, or unsure. Any of those will be helpful. All right, once it seems like we've got uh, enough responses from folks, we are going to move to our second question. So please, if you haven't answered the question, please go forward and do so now. Okay, second question that we have, is your credit union considering secondary capital for concern about the return on investment? Yes, no, or unsure. And again, this is okay if you're unsure about this. This is why we have Kathy and Ahmed to answer these questions. So is your credit union considering secondary capital uh, but concerned about the return on investment? For folks that are having trouble um, seeing the poll, um, we, uh, we can have somebody reach out to you. And don't worry, even if you, you can't uh, participate in this, uh, we'll be going through these, these questions by the end. In 
and for tech assistance folks, please click the blue chat bubble on the bottom right corner at the home page and an expert from Advanced Net Labs will assist you. I know that we have one more question before we uh, move over to our speakers, so whenever, uh, whenever we're ready to go, uh, we'll entertain that question. All right, and last question is how familiar are you with secondary capital? Again, you should see this prompt in front of you if, uh, if everything is working well, not familiar at all, somewhat familiar, very familiar, or you are a current borrower. So our last question before we hand things over to our speakers, how familiar are you with secondary capital? We are just about ready to move into the presentation portion of the uh, session. Amit, I am going to hand things over to you. Um, and again, folks, if you have questions throughout this session, please share those um, in the chat and we will be aggregating those and getting to them at the end of the session. Amit, I will hand over to you. Thanks, Paul, and good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this morning's session on secondary capital. Uh, just looking at some of the responses to the poll questions, there's no right or wrong answers. Um, and I just really appreciate to actually see that we've got such diversity um, in our participants. You know, it, there, there are so many questions when it comes to secondary capital. And while we just have a little bit of time uh, this morning, uh, we're gonna really give you a walkthrough to give you a better insight about what secondary capital is. Uh, and then what the application process looks like. Uh, but we'll also, again, avail ourselves to you after this particular session so that we can take a deeper dive into those uh, pushing questions that you really, really wanna know of whether or not secondary capital is for your credit union. Um, and before we get in, uh, just wanna like really set the, the, the playing field for us when we talk about financial inclusion. The World Bank defines financial inclusion as a condition when individuals and businesses have access to useful and affordable financial products and services that meet their needs. Uh, these are the transaction payments, savings, credit and insurance, um, and, but that they're delivered in a responsible and sustainable way. The COVID-19 crisis has become an all too familiar part of our regular conversations. I know many of us you know, have COVID fatigue, uh, but you know, during this time we're watching in, uh, record unemployment business closings, you know, and mixed messages, you know, direction coming from the very top, that's only served to, uh, to exacerbate the challenges uh, that we, we face, you know, as credit union leaders. Many of you probably have seen the survey that came out uh, just probably about a week ago from the FDIC uh, that was, you know, providing unbanked rates by state. Uh, you know, and some of us are wringing our hands and saying, okay, well, where did they get these, you know, figures from? But in that recent survey released by the FDIC, uh, more Americans than ever obtained a basic bank account in 2019. Uh, but again, this data was gathered prior to the coronavirus outbreak and started this historic recession. Uh, the important part of the entire survey is the postscript. You know, it's always, let's really check the details. The agency noted that the loss of jobs and incomes due to the pandemic in 2020 likely reversed all of these positive trends. Uh, the FDIC study examined the unbanked, you know, those Americans who do not have a basic checking or savings account and the reasons why they don't have, uh, you know, the, these accounts, you know, that they're operating outside of the traditional banking system. And while there are a small number of Americans that choose not to have a bank account due to their distrust of the banking system, most unbanked are in poverty and more likely to be Black and Latino, uh, which is a remnant of the systemic racism that continues to plague the financial system. Uh, the survey noted or uh, estimated that 5.4% of Americans in 2019 were considered unbanked, which was a record low since they began reporting this metric uh, back in 2009. And it was down from 2017's uh, figures of 6.5%. Uh, so, you know, when you look at this, you know, that, that percentage is equal to roughly 7.1 million households. Um, and the 5.4% figure doesn't tell the full story. Uh, mostly because racial and ethnic minorities are disproportionately more likely to be unbanked. Uh, the FDIC study showed that only 2.5% of white households are unbanked, while 13.8%, almost 14% of black households, and 12% of Hispanic households are considered unbanked. 
Uh, this is roughly one out of four households that we're talking about that make less than $15,000 a year that don't have a bank account. Now, the FDIC was unable to give an estimate on how much the COVID pandemic has moved bank Americans into the ranks of the unbank, but it's almost certain that that figure is climbing. Uh, many of us remember the Great Recession. It caused millions of Americans to lose their bank account, and the number of unbanked hit a record high of 8.2% back in 2011 in the aftermath. Uh, you know, furthering, the pandemic has caused job losses mostly for workers who need to be physically present for their jobs. The essential workers, the restaurant workers, theater workers, those working in retail, etc. And many of these jobs are lower paying and have fewer steady paychecks compared to the typically white collar office worker now, we, now working remotely, uh, like many of us. Uh, you know, the unbanked have significant and costly disadvantages in everyday lives compared to the banked. Uh, with routine payments to landlords, utility companies, or sending money to friends and family, it often requires them using expensive check cashing and money transfer services. Uh, furthermore, being unbanked makes it more difficult to get quick access to government programs. Um, that includes the $1,200 stimulus payments that came earlier this year from the stimulus bill. So as the visionaries, you're placed in a unique position to challenge this narrative and the status quo by looking less at the crisis at hand and instead to the opportunities it presents. Uh, the famous inventor, Thomas Edison, uh, is quoted as, as saying, uh, opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overalls and it looks like work. Um, you know, in every crisis, there is an opportunity. You just have to be courageous enough to look for it. Um, and along with that courage, bring a pair of overalls because it's going to take work. You know, and if you're like most credit unions, you've had the courageous conversations with your board, your capable leadership team to face this crisis head on. Your credit union is going to be that beacon, that light shining brightly on a hill, pointing the way towards building more financially inclusive communities through affordable and sensible products and services. And now it's that time to map out your execution strategy. Um, along the way, you know, there are great ideas and opportunities identified, but the nagging dilemma, the 800 pound gorilla that's in the room remains an obstacle. How do you fund it and still remain well capitalized? Well, amidst the global pan pandemic and the corresponding social and economic crises, the need for local community lenders to provide patient, flexible capital in communities depleted by job loss and income disruption is vital to keeping local economies afloat. And there are effective tools such as secondary capital to help credit unions to both address systemic roadblocks towards building more financially inclusive communities and strengthening an institution's financial performance. So we had the question, how familiar are you with secondary capital? Uh, you know, secondary capital, it's a capital resource for low income designated credit unions. Uh, so the, quick, the first question, you know, are you a low income designated credit union? Uh, that's a prerequisite for secondary capital. Uh, the second point, it's a it's subordinated debt. And I know, I know the D word can make, uh, you know, some of us cringe, uh, but it's subordinated debt that counts towards a credit union's regulatory net worth calculations. Um, and it's counted as debt for gap. Uh, but as equity for the purposes of calculating net worth until five years before maturity. Um, and in those last five years of its term, it's counted at 80, 60, 40, 20% uh, of par value respectively. So just a quick history of uh, NCUA's history with a subordinated debt. 1996, uh, it, it allowed low income credit unions to hold secondary capital and it's evolved. It's still evolving today, uh, even where we are still within uh, the, the sub debt rule. It hasn't, hasn't even been implemented yet. And there are some credit unions that I've even I've spoken to that they've been concerned about whether or not we should wait uh, you know, to apply for secondary capital. Uh, if you apply for secondary capital today, you'd be grandfathered in. So even with the sub debt rules that uh, will be coming down the road, uh, you're still safe from those. Um, and I would just say that not to have as much concern um, as, as you probably think you should have at this juncture. So the purpose of inclusive secondary capital is to provide capital uh, to strengthen the capacity of community development credit unions, the CDCUs, alphabet soup, 
um, and furthering inclusive mission of helping low and moderate income individuals and communities achieve financial independence. Now, this is not an exhaustive list of uh, uses of secondary capital, but just common uses of secondary capital. Uh, you know, number one is to expand community impact and services to underserved communities. Um, it's used to innovate and scale loan products and development services that are designed for low income and marginalized communities. It's also to help increase engagement of unbanked and underbanked communities. Um, and lastly, to help you integrate community development initiatives into larger strategies. Now, Inclusive offers two types of secondary capital products, Secondary Capital One, which is a balloon repayment, and Secondary Capital Two, which is an amortizing option. Uh, we also have the, uh, the Southern Equity Fund, um, and that's designed to promote economic mobility among low wealth and underserved communities, uh, to preserve and build diversity in community-owned and controlled financial services, and to increase the impact of scalable institutions throughout the American South. Uh, this fund uh, makes investments up to $5 million in secondary capital loans to high-impact CDCUs. Um, and Inclusive is the first national lender of secondary capital and uses its resources to amplify the impact of member CDCUs. Uh, this is done uh, in cooperation with the Kresge Foundation, a private national foundation uh, that builds and strengthens pathways to opportunity uh, for low-income people in American cities. Uh, they've joined Inclusive as a limited partner of the fund by providing $5 million, a $5 million equity investment as a credit enhancement for social impact investors. So a deeper dive into Secondary Capital One. Secondary Capital One borrowers, while they are also encouraged to repay the amortized portions, uh, they're expected to make a balloon repayment at maturity. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it's Canada's uh, debt for gap, but again, uh, it declines 80, 60, 40, 20 um, of par value respectively. Uh, the maximum amount is $500,000 uh, with a max term of seven years. Um, and rates can be as low as 4.75 up to seven and a quarter with a nominal application fee of $250. The second option is the advertised repayment or secondary capital 2.0. Uh, unlike the balloon option in secondary capital one, secondary capital two borrowers are expected to repay the discounted portions as the loan amortizes. One caveat, uh, it's not for every credit union. Uh, credit unions have to have a composite CAMEL rating of one or two to uh, be eligible for secondary capital 2.0, the amortized repayment option. Uh, again, if your credit union is not in a CAMEL one or two, and I'm not asking that question, uh, but this is for you to do your own self-certification, uh, then perhaps secondary capital one, uh, the balloon option would be what you'd be looking at. Uh, the maximum amount is $2 million with terms up to five, um, I'm sorry, up to 10 years. Um, and rates are between 3.25 and seven and a quarter. Uh, nominal application fee again of $500. So I know that's a lot to digest, uh, but it's really important to note that while we're going through this, we will make that opportunity for you to again, take a deeper dive with us in a one-on-one. -on -one. So you're hearing about this secondary capital as debt. Uh, well, the famous investor Warren Buffett is quoted as saying that, a great investment opportunity occurs when a marvelous business encounters a one-time huge but solvable problem. So why do I say that? On its surface, secondary capital is unsubordinated, uh, unsubordinated debt. Uh, but I want you to look at it as an investment opportunity. Um, it's an opportunity for your credit union to invest in the betterment of the communities you serve. Uh, and also consider that secondary capital is that catalyst resource to increase uh, you know, financial and community impact. So one of our other poll questions was, you know, how much does it cost? Essentially, that's what it is. Uh, and calculating the return on secondary capital, you know, it, 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 it looks, you know, like it's, it's debt. And, you know, is this something that I should do because it's going to cost, you know, upwards of 5% uh, or so, uh, but it can pay for itself uh, when you leverage it properly. So just take a quick case study of a credit union. This could be your credit union. You know, your assets are 100 million. You're well capitalized with positive growth. Your annual asset growth is 8%, loan growth seven, and net income growth of 4%. Uh, but consider that even with growth, opportunities and future growth are limited per cumulative impact of asset growth outpacing your net worth growth. So looking at this case study credit union, 
uh, again, things are looking very good. Uh, you know, that, you know, assets are growing, uh, you know, loan growth is there. However, net income growth is only at 4%. Consider this on the base. After eight years, this credit union's total net income, $3 million. Now you inject a $1 million in secondary capital into this credit union. That credit union over the same course of time, because it's beginning with a bigger base, now that credit union can recognize $1.35 million in additional net income over that same period of time, resulting in increased share and asset growth and putting that credit union to, into a stronger capital position. I mean, as you can see on the graph, being at 6.53, versus 9.61, all with that same type of sustained growth and activity uh, that you as a credit union wanna see. Now I've taken you through that quick uh, run through of what secondary capital is about. Um, and now my distinguished colleague, Kathy Kim, will take you through the process of applying for secondary capital. Uh, Kathy, take it away. Great, thanks so much, Ahmed. And, and thank you everyone for joining us for this breakout session. We are so excited to have this opportunity to connect with you. And um, from this part of the presentation, I'll just be picking up where Ahmed left off and speaking more to the process and applying for secondary capital and some um, actual stories and uh, case studies of credit unions that have used it successfully to do well by doing good and strengthen their double bottom line. Um, so moving on to um, the next slide, thank you. So that'd be helpful just to share a story and uh, put a face to the type of case study that uh, Ahmed just walked us through. Um, and I'd like to share with you a credit union that we currently work with at Inclusive, Santa Cruz Community Credit Union, which has been a member of Inclusive for, for decades now. And credit unions like Santa Cruz um, Community have leveraged secondary capital to deepen and expand their community impact initiatives, as well as the financial growth of the credit union. Founded in 1977, Santa Cruz Community Credit Union has a continued legacy and commitment to its mission to promote positive social and economic change. And with the impacts of the COVID crisis, like many of you, um, especially on low income and communities of color, Santa Cruz Community Credit Union really led the way and was the first financial institution in their community to respond to the pandemic. Just like you, Santa Cruz Community is one of the financial first responders and really worked um, in incorporating the values of community development credit unions to really reach those that are traditionally overlooked by mainstream institutions, including in times of crises. So Santa Cruz Community Credit Union provided more than $400,000 in emergency loans to members of their community who needed money simply to buy groceries and pay bills and provided an additional 1.9 million in auto purchases and affordable housing uh, mortgages to low income members of their community as well as immigrants. This was part of their immigrant financial inclusion initiative that was part of their strategic plan prior to COVID. Um, through its longstanding work to support local small businesses and community partnerships, Santa Cruz was also one of the first financial institutions to respond to the COVID crisis and funded nearly $12 million in paycheck protection program loans to local small businesses, helping to save more than 1,400 jobs. They continue to develop a broad network of community partnerships to, co to connect the, the broader community as well as to create resources for their most vulnerable members. Uh, Santa Cruz worked with the County of Santa Cruz to create a micro um, loan um, resilience program um, because we know that not everyone was able to qualify for or um, participate in the PPP program. So what Santa Cruz did and what they've done in the past was find ways to partner with organizations and community leaders that also share the mission to develop this innovative program to um, provide funding resources and access to, to capital um, outside of the, the CARES Act program as well. And so just to speak a bit more to the financial impacts, because as Ahmed mentioned, this is also an investment that you're making as well as um, the secondary capital um, funder. And as a loan, it, it has to be repaid. 
um, and has to be a, a value that's recognized, I think, by all parties involved, the, your credit union, the investor, as well as the communities that you're serving. And so just really high level in terms of the financial impact of the secondary capital investment coupled with the leadership and the strategic vision of the Santa Cruz um, community credit union team, um, which is led by Beth Carr, um, they increased their assets by 47% and now represent more than 166 million in community controlled assets. And as a low income designated credit union and as a CDFI, a certified community development financial institution, we know that the majority of those assets are being held by and the credit is being provided to those most mar marginalized members of our community. In addition to that, they've expanded their membership, um, including um, in low income and immigrant communities by more than 8%. They've originated $161 million in community-based loans and increased their lending in by 41% in these three years. Um, they've strengthened an, um, their existing as well as developed new community partnerships. And most recently, as I mentioned earlier, with the county and other local community organizations by providing COVID relief programs. And this might sound familiar to you in just the way that you are engaging and really responding to your community needs. Um, in addition to that, they've used this opportunity um, to really expand their, their prior commitments to financial inclusion and looking very closely at um, immigrant communities and launched a bilingual and mobile banking platform to use technology to strengthen financial access for immigrant members and those living in rural financial deserts. And also, I think so another point that will be of, of interest to our, our group today is really, you know, what was the impact on the primary capital? Um, how does this affect um, your, the equity that, that you have um, on, on your balance sheet, as well as the equity you're building in your communities? And in the case of Santa Cruz, they've built up their primary capital by more than 58% after receiving the secondary capital loan and partnering with us through this program. That's not to say that secondary capital is a silver bullet, um, but really coupled with your vision, your dedication to the mission and the way we've structured our secondary capital program, we've seen um, this impact and success um, across our network, um, which brings me to our, our next point. I'm just showing you really high level um, the type of uh, growth uh, differentiators that we've seen with our cohort of credit unions participating in a secondary capital loan program. And we've seen similar findings as well in our inclusive finance report. And if you haven't had a chance to grab the latest copy, um, please let us know. It's also available on our website. And this is the CDCU difference. And with the inclusive capital team and our secondary capital offerings, really the reason why I exists, the reason why Ahmed and our team, we um, are here is really to support the work that you all are doing in strengthening financial inclusion through the lens of doing well by doing good. And really high level, what you see here is just the growth differentiators that, that we've seen from a financial perspective, as well as an impact perspective for credit unions that have partnered with us through our secondary capital program. Um, they've outperformed the mainstream industry in terms of their financial growth, but also by doing so by centering um, this shared mission of inclusive financial services. And as part of the inclusive network, some of the things that, that we share in common values that, that help guide us as a North Star, especially during these challenging times, is that equity is, is more than a line item on our balance sheet but it's the impact that we have on our communities from financial inclusion initiatives to economic development, as well as um, racial equity initiatives and um, that Ahmed had mentioned earlier through our Southern Equity Fund. And as Kathy mentioned during the opening plenary, our Inclusive Resilience Fund. Um, and so if we could go on to the next slide, just moving forward, I'll be walking with you through um, the overall secondary capital application process, um, as well as share with you just what we at Inclusive look for in terms of, of underwriting, what you all can expl uh, expect in terms of timeline. And I'm sure your favorite question to think of, you know, first thing in the morning is regulatory considerations. And so really one question that we often um, get and that you all might have is, so how long does this take and how do we get started? And the answer that, that we share is um, just based on our decades of experience and being that first um, national uh, lender of secondary capital is, it depends. And the real driving factor here is, is in step one, um, whether you currently have a strategic plan um, and a business plan. 
Um, for us as CDCUs, this also includes an evaluation of, of our community needs. And really um, what we've seen is this is the most critical part of the process. Secondary capital on these additional funding sources, whether it's um, CDFI grant funds or other um, types of resources, uh, they, they exist to support the vision that, that you all have as you sort of reimagine the space and looking at the needs of, of your community, um, looking at your financial trends, as well as any capital gaps that, that you might have or might foresee and really executing your goals. And a, a business plan is simply this. Um, it's and our business models are, are to create, realize, and to deliver value. And this can be a, a separate conversation or a session um, I don't want to rush this, but did want to share with you just really high level for those of you that might be wondering. So what is required in a successful business plan? And, and really a business plan is a living document. It's a roadmap for you and your team to kind of map out and, and move together in executing the goals that you and your board um, might have outlined. It has enough details to really help close that strategy and execution gap. And there are a lot of benefits. It does take several weeks to, to develop and a lot of analysis and reflection. And this might be a challenging time for, for many credit unions as you might be in the middle of a strategic plan or in the process of, of developing a, a new one um, in response to the COVID pandemic. But really when it comes down to it, it is simply this, it's, it's a roadmap to help close that strategic, um, that strategy and execution gap and ask your team um, three pivotal questions. Why, why, why do you exist? Why are you, um, providing the products and services and the partnerships that you're cultivating. Um, so, so knowing your purpose, how, what are the sort of programs, um, growth strategies, um, products and services that you'll be delivering to help meet those needs um, and uh, address the different sort of asset needs that might be required in successfully executing those gaps, whether it's the financial needs um, and, and gaps, looking at your financial performance and, and trends, technology, um, your members, your um, social capital and, and community partnerships. And so you wanna make sure that you're looking across the enterprise and all the different types of, of asset classes. And really, um, lastly, what what are the goals and what's the outcome and the, uh, and the impact that you and your team seek to achieve? And you want to do this both through the lens of your, your financial gains, but then also as CDCUs, um, really, what is the impact that you're going to have on your community? And um, a, a business plan should comprise of the following um, sections, and I'll just do a high level sort of, of overview um, to address, I think, some of the trends that we've seen um, from the, the collective network and hopefully provide you and your team with some helpful guidance in just framing the conversation with, with you and, and your board, or maybe just to check and, and see, you know, if the plan that you currently have in place address these needs. One um, is, do you have an executive summary? And this should really tell us about the current state of your uh, credit union, your vision, your mission statement, um, your, your impact um, model. And this should be a, a short summary. You're going to have other parts of the business plan to go really into depth, a high level sort of uh, overview of what your growth strategy is and how you're going to achieve um, the, these goals. Um, and for us, uh, if you're applying for secondary capital, also describe the extent to which the request of secondary capital is going to affect your credit union's ability to achieve the identified mission, the strategic goals, and, and business objectives. Um, the next section should include a description of, of your credit union. Um, one thing that we've seen is um, we are so proud and of, of our history of you know, our, our credit unions. Um, and you should definitely in include that in your, your business plan, but that should not be the focus of the business plan. This is really a roadmap for, th for the future of growth and really tying together again, the strategy and execution um, gap and helping your team understand, you know, how you're gonna achieve the goals that have been outlined. Um, so again, in the credit union description, that should also include uh, a summary of your field of membership uh, organization, as well as your, your management. Um, I think the next three areas have been really critical for, for CDCUs, and especially if you're thinking of pursuing um, secondary capital. But, but in general, these are really, uh, I think, important questions to, to keep in mind as you develop your impact plans, really to take a close look at your, your market analysis as well as your competitive advantage, um, not really identifying um, you know, the, the trends, the opportunities, as well as the risks. That has one of the top five sort of um, 
challenges that uh, that management teams, even outside of the credit union, run up against. So make sure you're taking the time to summarize your current membership, your potential membership, where you might be seeking to ex um, open a, a new branch or expand your, your charter, and look at the, the needs of the community. You want to look at different types of resources, both at your internal data sources as well as external, especially now and as, as we have been um, that was really acutely addressed during the opening plenary sessions. You want to also make sure that you're capturing the needs of, of communities that are often overlooked, um, especially now with this. Um, while it might have been a longstanding reality for, for many of us, but to some of us, it might be new, looking especially at the needs of, of marginalized communities and specifically communities of, of color. Um, there's so many growth opportunities there from an impact perspective as, as well as a financial perspective and the way we can help build more inclusive and equi um, equitable teams. Um, and in this section, you should also address the financial needs, gaps, and again, um, do a landscape of the competition. Um, that might be, be challenging or may not be a favorite exercise, but that's really gonna help you ad identify you know, what your strengths are and really where the opportunities are. Um, so you and your team are gonna know, um, you know what types of pursuits to, to, to pursue. Um, the next section should include a summary of your loan products and development services and really identify how you organize what products and services your credit union's offering. What are your, your main sort of um, you know, products and services that are being used by the community and, and how are they meeting the sort of needs that were identified earlier? Um, the next section should include, it's either sometimes identified as, as a marketing plan, but really a summary of your growth uh, delivery and outreach strategies. Um, one, summarize your growth strategy, and it usually comes down to three general buckets. Um, one, is it to sustain your growth? Two, is it to uh, support a market expansion, either geographic or in terms of expansion to underserved or underbanked communities that, that Ahmed had walked through earlier? Are you seeking to provide new financial products, uh, new financial services, or new development services? Um, and, and from that, you want to really speak to your credit union's ability to serve this market, um, as well as resources that might be necessary in order to, to better serve this market. And really, um, what is the game plan going to be there? What um, sort of risk um, management tools that will be implemented? What, how you and your team are going to determine whether to tap the gas or tap the brakes? Um, so you want to have those key sort of enterprise risk management sort of um, guidelines established as well. Um, and the next two parts would, should be your community development plan as well as your financial position and your projections. Um, with regards to um, the financial projections, and again, at the end, we are gonna have time for questions and, and answers. Um, the one point that I would share about the financial position and, and projections is that uh, when you develop your pro forma, um, you should really take a hard look at you know, how realistic the position um, or, or the projections are. Take a look at your recent financial trends. And then also now, you know, as we are at this very unprecedented and, and challenging economic times, um, look at uh, really your performance and other economic um, down cycles. And you wanna be able to do some scenario analysis as well to see what is feasible and also really um, what alternate scenarios might look like, especially, um, given the, the current environment and the, the uncertainty of these current times, you're not gonna be able to project to the dollar really what's going to happen in three years, but you do want a general management framework to see realistically based on um, past performance and what you're seeing now to have a general sort of um, framework for you and your team to be able to determine where um, you may want to spend your, your resources. So that brings me to our, our next point. Um, if you go to the next slide, yes. Um, so here we have a copy of the Inclusive Capital Secondary Capital application. Um, this is available on our website and please feel free to reach out to myself and Ahmed um, for a copy of the application. I'm not gonna, I promise I won't read this out, to, out loud to you, um, but the way Inclusive has designed our own application process is really to, um, to be a successful partner and to have that accountability because for us, secondary capital loans excuse me, are not just transactions, really as a partnership, whether it's with Santa Cruz or the, the other 30 or so credit unions that, that we currently work with. Um, it, it's really about us working together towards that collective mission of strengthening financial inclusion and building equity in our communities. And 
Um, what you see here, the application is pretty streamlined and the way that we designed our application process is to be inclusive of the shared impact goals as well as the whole double, double bottom line approach so that we're looking at biz community impact as, as well as financial impact on the, the credit union and um, as well as the regulatory requirements, which I'll get to in, in just a, a minute. Um, so on the application here, just really a high level, you know, you input your, your contact information, indicate your charter type. Um, on the right hand side of the screen, um, really should check off, uh, tell us which secondary capital product uh, you and your team are interested in applying for. And I'm not sure the guidelines earlier. We cannot ask you your, your camel rating. And then as you may have heard earlier, that's really going to be a driving factor in determining your eligibility for either the amortizing or the non-amortizing version. Um, but uh, you know your camel rating. And so um, it would um, you, you should make that call prior to submitting the, the application. So um, if you um, go on to the, the next slide, please, Ahmed, you know, folks can kind of see an overview of really what other information we're requiring. And this is just like really high level in terms of helping us understand your impact as well as who you're serving. Um, if you are CDFI certified credit union, and just a quick note that you do not have to be CDFI certified in order to um, apply for or receive secondary capital from inclusives, you must be low income designated, as Ahmed had mentioned earlier, that's required by the regulations, um, but CDFI um, certification is not required. Um, however, I will say that um, most of our members and, and borrowers do go on to if they're not already CDFI certified, just because of the alignment between their business plan as well as their impact goals. Um, but, but here, um, we're asking for the demographics to really help us understand the communities you're serving as well as the, the impact of, of, your, of, of your lending. Um, and so if you go on to the next slide, please, Ahmed, moving forward um, to the application list. So um, here, you'll also see a the checklist of the documents that we require for um, our secondary capital application process. And again, this is to be inclusive of really helping us to have a really good um, partnership, but also to help satisfy the regulatory um, requirements, which we'll get to in just a minute. So you have the document checklist as well as a certification of a material events form um, as well. Uh, another quick note that I'll, I'll share with you is that um, really uh, the purpose of our program is again to advance our, our shared and collective mission of advancing financial inclusion. Um, we were the first national lender of secondary capital um, and we've continued to advocate for resources for CDCs um, and others serving um, historically marginalized communities. And what I'll say about just um, about our sort of batting average with our secondary capital applicants and why our uh, process is designed the way that it is, is um, what we've seen so far is that, um, you know, 98% of all the secondary capital applicants that are approved by our uh, credit committee um, and go through our process actually go on to receive uh, approval from NCUA on their secondary capital plans. I know that's a question that we've received um, pretty um, frequently from, from others as well. And it's not to, to guarantee approval, but just to kind of share with you um, what our, our partnership has been like with credit unions and our role in just trying to be supportive and amplifying the leadership of your credit union team and the impact that you have on, on your community. And, and so um, just to move on to the regulatory requirements, uh, you know, so for us, the sort of process map that we shared with you, that is Inclusive's own regular um, recommended best practices, especially for first time borrowers. Uh, NCUA does not um, require you to obtain funding or funding commitment in advance of submitting a secondary capital plan. But especially for first time borrowers, we found that it is helpful to have that commitment letter from a, a funder um, that is committed to making a secondary capital loan. Um, also, just through our evaluated process, we um, do not write the business plan or secondary capital plan for our members or potential borrowers, but we do, as, as a peer, just ask some of the guiding questions that, that um, will be asked from um, regulators, but also from the success that we've seen in terms of of evaluating um, and assessing business plans and partnering with our CDCs on, um, on different uh, financial inclusion and community impact initiatives. So when it comes to um, regulations, and again, this is just for um, 
uh, federally chartered credit unions, one sort of disclaimer is that if you are state chartered, you are going to want to look at your own state um, regulations regarding secondary capital. In our experience, for the most part, your state regulations will mirror what NCUA has codified in, in section 701.34. And you have a high level summary, you know, right there on the screen, but please check with your state regulator as well. Um, so one of the requirements that NCUA has is uh, submitting something called a secondary capital plan. One thing that we would share is, you know, as we kind of walk through the five key components of a secondary capital plan is that please let your examiner know before um, you submit the secondary capital plan. It should not come as a surprise to them. Um, really, uh, it's, it's also about that relationship management as well. Um, just to speak, you know, high level data, industry-wide data, there are only about 70 credit unions in the entire industry out of a total eligible pool of about 2,500 or so low income designated credit unions that currently have secondary capital. So the degree of familiarity or experience your examiner may have with secondary capital may also vary. So you do wanna give them, them a heads up. So just wanted to share that with, with you um, as well. So here um, with regards to the main regulations that you wanna consider when it comes to secondary capital, again, um, you wanna to turn to regulation 701.34 and it states the eligibility for, uh, for, for credit unions to uh, acquire secondary capital. And it's really limited to low income designated credit unions. And you also have to submit something called a secondary capital plan to your NCA regional director. Um, and the secondary capital plan is comprised of these five key components. Um, really it's a loan, so you have to demonstrate uh, how much, up to how much you plan to accept, um, the purpose that for which it's it is to be used and really that's why we go through um, and we really underline the strategic planning aspect of it the secondary capital plan should not be exclusive of but it should be complementary to the strategic plan and the business plan that you and your board have established and again um, because it is a loan uh, it and uh, it, it's being used to help um, advance and help the credit union continue to grow um, it does have to be repaid so the the secondary capital plan, as well as the financial projections to demonstrate and illustrate that the credit union will ha um, have sufficient liquidity to repay the loan at maturity. Um, and again, um, point number four, you must demonstrate that the secondary capital plan um, conforms to the strategic plan, um, as well as the budget that you and your board may um, have in place. And last but not least is that you should also, you must also include um, financial projections. NCA regulations requires projections going out two years and we have received a lot of comments here. Right now, things are so uncertain. How are you to know like what's even going to happen in the next couple of, of quarters? Um, and we definitely do hear you, um, but this is required in, in the regulations. One thing that might be helpful is for you and your team to do some sort of scenario analysis um, to show um, the sort of uh, reasonability um, or just the, the sort of logic and assumptions that are being used to develop those financial projections. One other note that we'll share is again, the regulations require just two years, but we have seen um, you know, increased sort of requests for longer term performance. With regards to inclusive zone process, we do require that the projections cover the, the full term of the full requested term of, of the loan. And so just kind of moving forward until the, the next sort of set of regulatory framework. Um, so another note, and we've never seen an instance of a credit union kind of reaching the, the ceiling, but there are actual borrowing limitations for credit unions and you can turn to the Credit Union Act in section 7, 107, um, but the total borrowings and um, the amount that you will be requesting for secondary capital should not exceed more than 50% of your paid and unimpaired um, capital surplus. So that's just something to keep in mind. I don't think I've ever seen a secondary capital plan go up to, to um, that amount. Also just kind of like looking at the projections and the repayment requirements. Um, I think that kind of also explains why we just don't see secondary capital plans reaching that amount, but we did want to, you know, make that um, very clear and upfront and, and center to you all. And the last sort of uh, set of regulatory considerations, and again, we're happy, you know, reach out to us, we'll send you a copy of our application as well as the full set of regulations regarding secondary capital. Um, but the, the last four points really go to 
um, the cost benefit analysis and the return on investment point that Ahmed shared. And I think many um, potential uh, borrowers have, have reached out to us. And one question is, is why secondary capital so much more expensive than deposits? I can go out to my corporate and, and get, you know, X amount in deposits for, you know, 100 basis points. Why would I pay, you know, 4% for, for secondary capital? And the reason is, um, well, it's for a few reasons. One is um, because of what secondary capital is. It's, remember, it is a loan, um, but it's counting towards your regulatory net worth, towards your equity, right, versus deposits, which you're using for liquidity to, um, to, um, to make loans. So with secondary capital, you can use that um, additional uh, regulatory net worth to support that increase in assets and shares that you all might be experiencing um, now, in addition to the community development initiatives, we've seen unprecedented levels of, of share growth. The industry sort of averages were about 17% as, out of, as of June. We know with CDFIs and CDCUs is actually, um, many of you have reported even stronger growth rates. So that's something else to consider. And um, another point, and just really to, to help you understand where we're coming in as investors and with our sort of circle of uh, mission aligned investors is that secondary capital, something called subordinated debt, meaning that it is uninsured. For us as investors, we're really going um, all in as partners because we believe in, in your leadership, your business model, um, as well as um, um, the way you're, you're managing the credit union and, and meeting needs. Um, secondary capital being subordinated debt means that we have no right to repayment, unlike deposits, which are insured up to $250,000, or in excess of that, if you have excess share insurance, secondary capital, subordinated debt. And so we have, uh, we will be the last to get repaid, um, if at all. So just wanted to put that out there as well, since that's a question that we receive um, on a pretty frequent basis. Um, so moving forward, and I do want to wrap up and have enough time for, for questions as well. Um, so after you submit your secondary capital plan, if it gets approved, um, NCUA, according to the regulations, has up to 45 days to respond to uh, your secondary capital plan. Um, so the, let's say, you know, it gets, uh, sometimes it does take longer, though they will often come back with, with a couple of questions. Um, but after your secondary capital plan um, gets approved, uh, here at Inclusive, we'll send you copies of our own closing documents, which includes the NCUA's disclosure and acknowledgement form. That's the only documentation that is outlined in the, um, the regulations regarding secondary capital. Um, but we also have our own closing documents. So we would send you a copy of our loan agreement as well as a promissory note. And um, you would also have to have board authorization, um, either a resolution or copy of your minutes, just authorizing the credit union to uh, accept a secondary capital loan. And then from there, we continue to partner and really working together and supporting you and your team and executing that long term sort of strategy and the impact goals. And so I'll just kind of pause there. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure we had time for questions for, from our audience. Um, but again, thank you so much for being a part of, of the session today. And we really look forward to hearing from you. I want to thank Kathy and Ahmed for going through what seems to be a very, very complicated process, and I think at some points it can be. Um, but what is really excellent is that you have a team at Inclusive. Um, there's also, um, outside of Kathy and Ahmed, uh, includes uh, Evan Schaefer, our CFO. So I, one thing I would just say is there's a couple points. So one is in the chat function, you will see contact information for both Kathy and Ahmed. Uh, you can also, I would, I would say go there because really this, this conversation was meant to really prompt further and deeper questions on part of your institutions. Um, and really that next prompting is to have a conversation with this team so that they can understand your specific um, interests uh, so that they can understand kind of the, the questions and thoughts, the concerns that you have. And hold on, I think somebody's saying I've got a little bit of background noise. Hopefully you can hear me a little bit better. But um, if there are any questions, we would absolutely um, love them from you. One thing I would just say in the last couple of minutes that we have about five minutes or so, Kathy uh, or Amit, could you maybe just kind of talk through uh, some of the common, I, I don't want to call them stumbling blocks, but maybe uh, initial uh, uh, start uh, start issues that, that credit unions have as they're, as they're looking at this other, you know, uh, coalition building internally, as it, it's just going through the applications. Can you maybe talk through some of that?
Sure, uh, Paul. You know, I think many credit unions see that secondary capital can help them, uh, but probably don't take uh, the, the full opportunity to recognize the work that is required. Um, hence, going back, you know, to the original slide uh, that just spoke about, you know, an, an opportunity. You know, it, it, it takes coveralls, uh, and I think that I found uh, the the buy-in that's necessary from top down. It's not just enough to, you know, have a plan, have objectives, you know, even have the vision, you know, that's been cast out there by leadership. You really have to make sure that there's a capacity study completed internally uh, so that you can carry out that plan. And that's going to be part of what we do in cooperation uh, with our member credit unions to make certain. So as Kathy went through, we're, when we're asking questions about your staff, it's really to, you know, kind of like help you check yourself to say, if we want to launch, you know, a wheels to work program, that you've got a strong lending team, but that you've also done the marketing analysis to say that here is a problem that the solution that we can put forth um, is able, able to address it. And then I would say um, the, the book into that, uh, and Kathy also touched on this, is making sure that the plan aligns with the financial projections. Um, you know, nothing can be more frustrating uh, than, than having a full plan that says we're going to do $2 million, you know, in uh, emergency loans. But then you look at the financial projections and nothing's there. <laughs> so again, uh, you know, the, the devil's in the details. Um, and as I like to say, you know, uh, if, it's, it's nice to have strategic plans, business plans uh, that have qualitative objectives. Uh, but really, when it comes to secondary capital, you know, it's all quantitative. Measure, measure, measure. Uh, you know, my old saying is that if it's not measurable, it's not strategic. Yeah, no, that's a great point, Ahmed. And um, thanks for the question, Paul. Um, yeah, just taking a deep breath there. I think it's everything plus one to what Ahmed said. Um, but also just to take a step back and think culturally um, within the credit union industry, um, you know, one of the, the, the great benefits is that, you know, we have these set field of fields of membership and so much accountability to our, our communities. And, um, you know, uh, we're democratically governed each member, regardless of the amount of shares that they, they have in their share account, um, everyone gets one vote. Um, but, you know, if we, if we look at other types of, of industries, they are, I think, more um, accustomed to um, doing these sort of pitches or attracting or, you know, raising external capital and um, paying for, you know, for, for equity. And I think that's, one challenge that um, that many credit unions have is that the whole sort of um, shift towards you know borrowing um, money or specifically you know equity capital. I think that that's been a challenge. Um, also, too, uh, really when it comes down to the strategic plan, um, we touched upon this earlier, and Ahmed just um, you know highlighted that as well. Um, not having the sort of you know, specifics when it comes to the, the strategy. Um, sometimes we'll see really great, um, you know, goals um, and, and values, but really, how are you going, what, what's the, the capital that's required? You know, what's the roadmap there? How are you and your team going to be able to achieve those goals? And I think sometimes the details in the strategic plan, that's, um, that, that might not be fleshed out. The credit unions often have that information, but when, you know, you're getting ready to, to do something new, I think it's really important to kind of write it out in, in the business plan so that your team can look at it together and have that shared sort of accountability and, and collective roadmap. Um, and then lastly, you know, secondary capital is um, an investment, right? And uh, yes, you are required to have financial projections, but that the exercise and planning for secondary capital really needs to look at the full credit union and the full enterprise and not just the balance sheet side. So I, I did want to share that with folks as well. You know, you want to talk to your full, um, to uh, look at your, your, your full, um, you know, team, um, look at your, your community development initiatives. Um, are you understanding what the needs are? And you know what, like things, things might change. I think it's a great time right, right now, you know, if you have the capacity to do that pause and that, that reassessment, but really, you know, if you are looking to either update your strategic plan in general, it's a good practice, but also, you know, with secondary capital, make sure you're looking across all the different assets as well as the different lines of, of business. 
um, which then should you know, culminate you know, in the financial projections, but it should not be only from the, the finance side. I think that's also something that we've seen. You know, there, we, we had several um, non-members uh, as well as a few members reach out to us and share with us that they had worked with others on you know, secondary capital plan, but it was really just from the, the sort of um, a perspective where there, uh, a, a different partner was, you know, generating financial like performance, and you know their plans were in getting approved, um, and I think that is a core part of it. But you really need to have that integrated sort of strategy. And um, at this point, we are just about there at the end. I want to thank both of you, and I know that we have a question from Bill Carhart. What we'll do is, Bill, we will reach out to you to answer that question specifically. Um, before we wrap up, again, I want to thank. Uh, and Ahmed, I'd also like to thank the inclusive team that have been making this, uh, this convening possible. There's a lot of behind the scenes work. Um, before we get off, a couple of things just to know. Um, so uh, we are going to be moving back together into our next plenary session uh, shortly. And we're gonna hear from Jody Harris, director of the CDFI fund, as well as how community development credit unions have set up as financial first responders during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this Zoom meeting is going to close, but you can proceed back to the conference homepage to access the links to the plenary sessions and enter those Zoom meetings. We are going to get back together at 1245 Eastern Standard Time, Eastern Standard Time at 1245. So we look forward to seeing you at the plenaries. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, glad to, uh, to have you in these conversations and we'll be moving forward together. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.